Let me welcome you to this class on uh, topics in reinforcement learning. Um, you can see the link uh, to the class notes, uh, video lectures, and slides here. This is going to be a repository of all information from this class as well as our previous classes. This is the fifth time I'm giving this class at ASU. Each time is a little different. This year is also going to be a little different. And I will explain exactly how as we go along. Uh, today's, uh, uh, today's lecture is uh, an overview, an introduction to the course with a little bit of a technical content uh, in the second half. Uh, here's the outline. I'm going to start with the Alpha Zero program and other later programs. Alpha Zero is a famous program that plays chess and creates a lot of enthusiasm about the prospects of reinforcement learning. And I'd like to, in particular, to focus on the two components of the algorithmic design uh, in, um, in Alpha Zero and in related programs, which is the offline training algorithm. Uh, and then the online play algorithm, the ones that we use online to play, the training algorithm is a preparatory phase where the, where the, uh, the, the, the architecture is uh, trained with data. Okay, then I'm going to discuss a little bit, of, say a few things about the history of the subject, uh, overview some general concepts. Okay, then I discuss connections of the course with the various fields in artificial intelligence in decision control and operation research. Then go into, okay, after the first three topics, we're going to take a break, a 15 minute break, and then we're going to, to start on our technical, uh, the technical part of this course. We're going to discuss in particular dynamic program. Dynamic program is going to be a very central methodology in our course. And uh, we're going to discuss the case of deterministic problems where there's no uncertainty. Everything is known about the system. Everything is known about the effect of the, of the decisions that you make and so on. Next, in the next lecture, we're going to discuss stochastic problems. But deterministic problems are going to be important for our class and we're going to discuss them in this lecture. Then I'm going to give some examples of uh, deterministic problems uh, involving finite, a finite number of states and uh, these examples connect to discrete and combinatorial optimization, uh, which are going to also be important in our class. Then I'm going to say a few things about organizational issues, how this course, how this course is run and so on. So let me go into two remarkable programs, Alpha Zero and TD Gammon. Alpha Zero plays chess, TD Gammon plays backgammon, these two programs uh, uh, were 25 years apart, but they involve very similar architectures. Alpha Zero came out in 2017 and uh, uh, created a sensation with its quality and originality of play and uh, propelled uh, the reinforcement learning field to the front pages of the newspapers. TD Gammon was also a very impressive program, just as impressive as Alpha Zero particularly since it was the first program of its type, was 25 years before. However, both of these programs uh, share similar ideas, similar design. They both involve two algorithms. Now, a lot of people don't realize that there are two algorithms involved in alpha zero. Uh, the first algorithm is the offline training algorithm which uses neural networks and data, self-generated data, to construct a value function, a scoring function for evaluating positions, and also a policy that can generate moves in, uh, in response to different positions. So all of this offline training takes place before the program plays any game against a human or computer opponent. The online play algorithm uses the results of offline training to play online with you and me and other computer programs. And it, uh, it uses multi-step look ahead, rollout and cost function approximation. Now, all of these are going to be, uh, be explained at length as we go along. But what I'd like to note is that these algorithms have a very strong connection with dynamic programming the classical methods of method of policy iteration, 
and also uh, reinforcement learning and machine learning type of approximations involving neural networks, training, and so on. Now, what we're going to try to do in this course is understand this methodology so that it applies far more generally. We're going to focus particularly in the architecture of alpha zero and TD gamma because I think this is the one that holds the most promise and it's also the most generally applicable. Uh, the applications are going to be, of course, far beyond games. We're going to look at control systems uh, and control system design, model predictive and adaptive control. Control systems are, of course, very important in robotics, in self-driving cars, in all kinds of control theory is a very old methodology that dates more than 100 years ago. And we are also going to apply this methodology to discrete optimization problems, like the kind of uh, uh, kind of problems that uh, people in operations research or combinatorial uh, uh, optimization uh, are interested in. So all of this is going to be part of the playing field within which we're going to apply the ideas behind alpha zero and TD gamma. Now, what I would like to, to do first is discuss the online play algorithm of alpha zero and the idea of approximation in value space. Sometimes the online play algorithm is called online tree search, search over a tree of decisions over a, a, a time horizon. And then I'm going to discuss the offline training algorithm. Now, the online play algorithm is what you see here in blue, okay? At a given chess position, or more generally, at a given state of the, of the decision problem, um, uh, it starts here, and it involves all these things that you see in blue. However, at critical points, it uses the results of offline training. And the offline training uh, provides two components. One is a position evaluator, which provides a measure of quality of the state over here, or the position over here at the end of the search. Um, it's a numerical function, which is obtained by some kind of training, neural network, or whatever. The, and there is also a base player which is a, a, a software that generates moves or makes decisions at given positions. All of this is obtained offline. And uh, so the online play algorithm aims to improve the performance of the base player by searching forward for, se for, for several moves through the look, a look ahead tree. So at the current position or the current state, it generates all possible moves one step ahead, then two steps ahead for whatever length of the look ahead there is. And then it simulates the base player for some more, more moves of, at, at, after it reaches the, these three leaves. And then it approximates the effect of future moves by using the terminal position evaluation. After it has done the search, then it backs it up to the current position and calculates values of the available moves or decisions at the root. And uh, this is basically a backwards dynamic program in calculation. And uh, it obtains a numerical value for every move and it books, picks the move that has the best value. So that's the way it works for a given decision a single decision. Then after this decision is made, we generate a new position and repeat, do the same, generate a new position and go forward all the way to the end of the, of the game or the end of the control interval, the decision interval. Now this is the architecture that is used in both TD Gamma and Alpha Zero and in other programs. Uh, but there are strong similarities also with the methodology of modern predictive control in control theory. Uh, in modern predictive control, basically the same architecture is used. At a given state, 
there's an optimization over uh, a look ahead tree or perhaps uh, an interval, uh, minimization over controls over a certain interval. And there may be an additional uh, simulation of a base player and then a cost function approximation at the end. This is called the control interval. This is called the prediction interval. And uh, there is a major difference in model predictive control, the state space, the number of the number of states is infinite. Okay, it's a continuous state space, like a two-dimensional space or three-dimensional space, as it is in uh, uh, vehicle dynamics, cars moving or airplanes moving over three-dimensional space and so on. There's an infinite number of space, uh, number of states. On the other hand, in games, the number of uh, the number of uh, states is finite. Other than that, however, the architecture is very similar in both cases. Moreover, the same architecture applies in discrete optimization by using something called rollout. You'll see the name rollout here, which we're going to deal with at some length. So this is how the online player in alpha zero and related contexts works. And now let me go into the offline training algorithm again in alpha zero. It uses a form of approximate policy duration. Policy duration at classical, is, as I mentioned, a classical algorithm in dynamic program. It applies approx an approximation of that algorithm, an approximate policy duration algorithm, which uses self-generated data. And let me explain how this works. Uh, the algorithm generates a sequence of players, software that generates moves at any given just position. We also call it a policy. And uh, the current player is used uh, to train an improved player and the process is repeated. So current player, we improve it and then go back again and get a sequence of players, one better or hopefully better than the other. Now this is done through a two-stage process. The current player is evaluated by playing many games. It plays many games, look, we look at the results and we evaluate the player in terms of, uh, of how often it, uh, it uh, wins, draws or loses. And uh, this evaluation function is represented by a value network uh, uh, through training. Um, so after we have this policy evaluation, we use it in a policy, policy improvement uh, operate, through a policy improvement operation to generate a new player. And this policy improvement operation uses some form of uh, multi-step look ahead minimization like the one I had in previous slide, except in alpha zero, it's somewhat peculiar. It's an approximate version called Monte Carlo tree search. Um, and then the improved player is again represented by a policy network through training. And uh, it takes the place of the current player and this loop is continued for as long as is necessary. There are also some nuances in all this and we're going to get into that over time, but this is the basic picture. Now, TD Gammon uses a very similar policy iteration algorithm for offline training of a value network. It's trained in a different way than uh, alpha zero. It's trained using a method called TD Lambda. And also it does not use Monte Carlo tree search. Monte Carlo tree search, you, you'll hear a lot about it, but it's not fundamental. It's basically some, some trick to speed up the computations by reducing the simulation burning. And uh, TD Gammon does not use Monte Carlo tree search. It also does not use a policy network it replicates the functionality of a policy network by using the value network and the one or two step look ahead. Um, model predictive control uh, and, uh, and, uh, and also in discrete optimization, um, we don't, the, they use forms of offline training, but they, are more, they tend to be more rudimentary. The, um, uh, the principal emphasis is in online play. 
we're going to explain all this and the different gradations on the on the functionality and on the on the requirements of uh, the offline training process. But that's the idea. Offline training first, and then going online using the online play algorithm. Now here's a major, uh, some major empirical observations. The Alpha Zero online player trained with zillions of computers and uh, and uh, parallel computation and uh, very sophisticated neural networks. Uh, the offline trained player does not play nearly as well as the online player. The offline trained player is uh, mediocre by comparison, whereas the online player plays phenomenal chess. Some major point here, which indicates that by online play, we can improve very much on the results and the performance of the on offline training. This is something that holds in greater generality and it's a major concept in our course. We're trying to exploit this possibility of using online play on top of offline training. So that's one thing to remember. Another empirical observation, which dates 25 years ago, is that TD Gammon plays much better with this middle portion, which we call truncated rollout, than without rollout. The name rollout, by the way, is a new, this is, it was coined by Tesoro, the originator of TD Gammon. Um, and it relates to backgammon, like rolling the dice um, and uh, rolling out the game and things like that. The, game, the, the name is used in many different meanings these days, but I'm going to be using it in the same way that Tesoro has used it. And uh, that's where the origin of the game is. Now, the history of TD Gamma is as follows. Uh, Tesoro had several backgammon programs. One, back on, one program is, was from the late 80s that used supervised learning, okay, a machine learning methodology that we're not going to get into. And he had some good results that attracted some attention, but the program was not playing nearly as well as humans. And, uh, uh, and a major leap forward was when Tesoro used reinforcement learning to train a backgammon player in 1991, but without this middle portion. Just one or two step look ahead, and then a trained cost function approximation at the end of the look ahead. Now, that program played pretty good backgammon, but, but not good enough to win over the best human players. Its performance was subhuman. In 1996, Tesoro introduced this middle portion, sort of extending the, the length of the look ahead, making the program look forward uh, by minimization and also through this base policy. And his program played extremely well, better than all humans. And in fact, in backgammon circles, people think that Tesoro's 1996 program is optimal, plays optimal backgammon. It's not really optimal, but it plays so good that people think it's optimal. So that's an important fact. It indicates that not only we can get improvement in performance by online play on top of offline training, but we can get even better results by extending the look ahead, particularly with this rollout, which is relatively cheap relative to this one. And let me say a few things also about this point. There's a difference between a uh, major difference between chess and backgammon. Uh, backgammon is a stochastic game. It involves rolling the dice. So it has some uncertainty involved in it. And also, because of this uncertainty, the look ahead tree expands very quickly. So in backgammon, one cannot use long look ahead. People use up to two steps of look ahead. Uh, maybe three, but but I think that the, the programs nowadays use no more than one, or no more than two steps of look ahead. By contrast, Alpha Zero looks like 20 moves ahead, 30 moves ahead, very long look ahead. 
because uh, the, the, the look ahead tree of, the, of, of chess grows much, uh, much more slowly than, than, uh, than TD gamma. So uh, by introducing this middle portion, Tesoro was able to increase the length of the look ahead without, without increasing the, the, the size of the look ahead tree, because this, this extension does not involve consideration of all possible moves, uh, but rather only the moves suggested by the base policy. So this is another point that we are going to discuss in our course, and we're going to spend a lot of time on rollout and its effect on the overall design of approximation in value space. Now, we're going to aim for explanations of this phenomena, draw insights from them, and uh, get uh, and motivate generalizations. And the mathematical mechanism that this is going to be done is through Bellman operators and dynamic, when the, which, which are involved in the dynamic programming algorithm. Uh, we're going to use visualization to draw insight. And there is a central role for Newton's method here. Uh, Newton's method is the one that you know and love from calculus. It's an algorithm for solving equations or optimization problems. We're going to see that the synergy between offline training and online play can be understood as a Newton method. And if you look at this figure, um, the, the general idea is that there's a Newton step for solving the Bellman equation in dynamic programming, which is the initial part of this look ahead minimization. And then this Newton step operates on the results of offline training and this online play also, which are given by this particular area. So these are enhancements of the starting point of Newton step through all these operations here. And what the Newton step does is it takes the cost function approximation, this J tilde that I have here, and it produces the performance of the online player. That's what the connection is, the mathematical connection. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of all this. In fact, we're not going to get into great detail uh, in this course, except two lectures from now. But I want you to be aware that there's a key insight, key understanding, and key methodology that's involved here that centers around Newton, Newton's method. Okay, so what are we trying to do in this course? Well, from an intellectual point of view, we try to provide a unifying framework for several areas of large scale of uh, computation. One is reinforcement learning as practiced by the AI community. Dynamic programming and approximations as practiced by parts of the control optimization and operation research community. Model predictive and ad adaptive control as practiced by the control systems community. And parts of discrete optimization like search algorithms uh, and other discrete optimization uh, settings as practiced like integer programming as practiced by the algorithms and, uh, and computer science community. So we'll try to put all this under a unifying umbrella and for this, we're going to rely on the algorithmic theory of exact, approximate, and abstract dynamic programming. The paradigm of alpha zero and TD gamma and similar design architectures, almost everything we're going to do is going to revolve around the type of architecture that I discussed earlier. Finally, Visualization, which is going to be based, uh, we're going to use, be using visualization to understand the role of Newton's method and the connection between offline training and online play. In doing so, we're going to try to bridge the gap between cultures of different communities. 
and also bring to bear the power of reinforcement learning to a broad range of applications. So let me say things, a few things about the history of the subject. Okay, so uh, the current state of the art is, uh, is a result of a very fruitful synergy between artificial intelligence ideas and the decision control ideas. Uh, dynamic programming is a very old methodology. It was introduced uh, in 1950s and even before that. The names of Bellman and Shannon, the father of information theory, and also incidentally, the father of computer chess, uh, these names are associated with uh, the origins of dynamic programming. Um, reinforcement learning was a field in artificial intelligence that was not going, did not seemingly go very far up until in the late 80s or so. Uh, people that were working in reinforcement learning uh, realized that their field had a lot of commonality with the uh, decision control and dynamic programming ideas. Now, all of this would probably uh, not go very far, except that there was a major success with the backgammon programs of Tesoro, which really attracted attention uh, and also created some enthusiasm about the prospects of this synergy between artificial intelligence and decision and control. Personally, I got involved in this field because uh, to a large extent, because I was so impressed with uh, the, the, the success of Tesoro's, uh, uh, Tesoro in, uh, with Thiri Yamon. And um, uh, so this motivated uh, further work in the mid nineties that involved uh, new algorithms, uh, some analysis to understand the algorithms and the, and the context to which they apply, various applications. And also there were, there were a couple of books that were published in the mid nineties, uh, the first books on the field. Then in the 2000s, there were some mega trends in technology. Uh, machine learning, became very big. Uh, it, uh, people started looking at neural networks with uh, renewed enthusiasm, with other machine learning techniques. Uh, computers became more powerful. And uh, so this became a topic of great interest. Then data became much more available. Uh, and, uh, and people had, had access to data and they used it to in their programs to generate applications that were quite impressive. Um, there, was, uh, there was a lot of activity in the field of robotics. Um, and uh, there was also a lot of activity and successes with deep neural networks. Uh, all of this happened in the mid 2000s and starting in the, in the, around, the around 2000. And, uh, and created a lot of activity. And part of that activity was the AlphaGo and AlphaZero programs in, uh, in 2017 by DeepMind, a uh, subsidiary of Google. Uh, and that exploded the field and created a lot of enthusiasm. Since that time, reinforcement learning has become a very, very hot field. Um, perhaps the hottest field in artificial intelligence, although we have now chat GPT, which uh, may, may, may create another, may, may divert interest in that direction. But reinforcement learning right now is a very, very hot field. And it's being applied in many, many different contexts beyond artificial intelligence and in games and uh, in, in decision and control, in, uh, in operations research, uh, all sorts of contexts. So what is the current state of the art here? Well, the approximate dynamic programming and reinforcement learning methodology is now ambitious and universal. Now, what do I mean by this? Exact dynamic programming, 
applies in principle to a very, very broad range of optimization problems. It's a methodology that has very broad range of applications. It applies to deterministic problems and to stochastic problems. It applies to combinatorial optimization problems and also optimal control problems that involve an infinite state and control space. It applies to problems with one decision maker or two antagonistic players that play a game. However, exact dynamic programming is plagued by two main difficulties. The first of dimensionality, the exponential explosion of the computational requirements as the size of the problem increases, and also the need of a mathematical model to write down the dynamic programming algorithm. You need to have a mathematical model and, that, uh, and that's not always easy to obtain. So as a result, even though the broad range of dynamic programming was recognized early on, the methodology did not go very far because computers were just not uh, powerful enough to provide implementations of exact dynamic programming. So that's where reinforcement learning approximations came in. They overcome the difficulties of exact dynamic programming in two ways, approximations, that involve neural networks and other architectures to reduce the dimension and hence the curse of dimensionality. And the use of a computer model in place of a mathematical model. You always have to have a model. It, either it's, it may be hidden within a computer, but it does not, it may, but, but then it does not have to involve mathematical equations like the mathematical model. And with a computer model, we can use simulation and carry all kinds, all the operations that are needed for execution of a dynamic programming algorithm in exact form. So simulation and the use of a computer model overcame this difficulty of the needing of needing a mathematical model. So what is now the state of the art? We have a very broad, broadly applicable methodology inherited from the generality of exact dynamic programming. It can address a broad, very broad range of challenging problems, deterministic, stochastic, dynamic, discrete, continuous, uh, games, and so on. On the other hand, the methodology is not very reliable. There are no methods that are guaranteed to work for all or, mis or, or even most problems. There is no secure method with guarantees. Uh, on the other hand, there are many different methods based on a, 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 a broad range of ideas, which you can try on your problem. And with uh, skill and luck, you may have a reasonable chance of success for most types of optimization problems, including some that are extremely difficult, like chess, for example. What is the role of the theory on all this? We're going to try to keep a connection with the theory um, and uh, its role is important. It helps to structure mathematically the methodology, guide the art, and also most importantly, delineate the good ideas in this field, the good algorithmic ideas from the flaky ideas and even the crazy ideas of which there's no shortage in this field. So that's where we are right now. And uh, let me also give you a quotation from uh, 25 years ago, from the preface of the Neurodynamic Programming book that I wrote with uh, John Tsiklis. And um, okay, it's a long quotation, I'll summarize it. It says that uh, our curiosity was aroused by reports of new methods that aim to provide effective suboptimal sub solutions to complex problems of planning and sequential decision-making over, over uncertainty that for a work, long time were thought to be intractable. Now, John and I were, were understood dynamic programming very well, but never in our, our wildest dreams would we consider uh, using dynamic programming in the, in, in contexts that, uh, that such as backgammon. These problems were completely intractable, completely outside our mental framework. And yet these people were 
claiming that we were having success with uh, problems of this kind. So that was very exciting for us. And our first impression, of course, was that the new methods were ambitious, overly optimistic, lacked firm foundation. We thought they were flaky, but they, the claims were so impressive that we decided to take a look. And moreover, uh, the, the development suggested that the correct approach for understanding these new methods was through dynamic programming, which we knew and loved. Uh, we spent three years working in this field, wrote our book, and after a lot of study analysis and experimentation, we believe that our initial impressions were largely correct, okay? This is indeed an ambitious ad hoc type of methodology, but for reasons that we now understand much better, it does have the potential of success with important and challenging problems. And after all these years, this assessment still holds true. Reinforcement learning is a flaky methodology. It offers no guarantees, but it has substance. And with, if you're clever enough, and if you're also lucky, and you have a big computer also, then you have a chance of solving some very important and challenging problems. Now for this, it's necessary to understand the full range of methodologies because as I said, um, there are many methods to try and not one of these methods is guaranteed to work on any given problem. Okay, so let's say, say a few things about the course. This course is uh, research oriented. It aims to explore the state of the art of approximate dynamic programming and reinforcement learning at a graduate level. Um, it, uh, ideally, it would help a PhD, uh, a person engaged in PhD research. Um, we are also going to focus on some topics more than in others, particularly rollout and policy iteration. Um, and, uh, a major objective is to provide you with the opportunity to explore research in this area. I'm going to be using material that uh, for the most part came from previous offerings of uh, the course in uh, uh, at ASU. After the 19, 2019 course, I wrote this book and then after the, 19, the 2000, 2020 course, I wrote this other book. And last year, I also wrote this book, which is also online. This is a relatively simple book that I, I uh, that, that uh, however, it's very, it provides a lot of insight on the kind of things that we're going to be doing. It's online and you should take a look. Uh, I also have a pretty substantial set of notes that are based on these books here. And uh, the notes are focused on the on, on the special reinforcement learning topics that we're going to cover uh, to a great extent. And at the website, given at the first slide of this presentation, you'll find the link to my website that has all the slides and the videos from the uh, from the previous course offerings, uh, several overview papers and other papers. Um, and uh, video lectures from uh, for overview presentations. There's a lot of material at this website and it connects very strongly with uh, our class. Uh, the material for this class, the 2023 class, is also going to be posted at the same web website alongside with all the previous material. Okay, so all of this should suffice for textbook. However, there are supplementary references. I have uh, a two volume dynamic programming book. This is not reinforcement learning, but it has connections with reinforcement learning. It contains quite a bit of approximate dynamic programming material, but it's more focused on dynamic programming. And also I have a research monograph that's more theoretical, more mathematical on abstract dynamic programming that's also online. Um, there is the 1996 book with Johnson Sicklis, and all of this material has a decision and control orientation. On the other hand, the field spans the, the range from control to, to artificial intelligence, and there's a very popular book uh, 
by Sutton and Barto is a new edition that came out a few years ago. It's online. A lot of people read this book and it's a supplementary source for you to connect what we do in this class and what people are focusing on in artificial intelligence. Okay. So I know that the, the important synergy between reinforcement learning and artificial intelligence and dynamic programming and decision control. Uh, conceptually, this is very important and uh, people are, have, are coming to understand that. Uh, on the other hand, there are some obstacles in making this connection. One has to do with terminology. These two fields use a different terminology. For example, reinforcement learning uses maximization of reward or maximization, maximization of value. Dynamic programming uses minimization of cost. And within co this, this context, the reward of a stage is, uh, is just the opposite of the cost of the stage. Reward of the stage in artificial intelligence can be explained as the opposite of the cost of the stage. So, you need a mental adjustment to switch a sign when you're talking about rewards and costs. Then in, in, in reinforcement learning, people use state values as opposed to state costs in decision control. Uh, we talk about value function rather than cost function. Okay, all of this is minor. It requires a mental adjustment, but there are some more major, some more in, some more serious discrepancies in terminology. Decision control uses the terminology of, of control systems, where there's a controller that makes, that applies controls to a dynamic system or a decision maker that makes decisions sequentially over time. Now a decision maker in reinforcement learning is called an agent, okay? Agent is something entirely foreign as, an, as a term in, uh, in, uh, in decision control. Um, in decision control, people use controls, apply controls or decisions. In reinforcement learning, we choose actions. Decision control deals with dynamic systems, discrete time dynamic systems, sometimes continuous time dynamic systems, with, uh, dis discrete time equations, differential equations, uh, partial differential equations. All of this in reinforcement learning is called the environment. Now, for a person coming from decision control, using environment in place of a dynamic system requires quite an adjustment. It required for me, I know. Um, and then there are differences in, uh, in uh, methodology terms. Um, the term learning is used in reinforcement learning a lot. It's part of the of, 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 of its, its name, reinforcement learning. Um, in, in decision control, it relates to simulation, solving a dynamic programming related problem by using simulation. The term learning connects with simulation in the control context. Self-learning. You'll see this term a lot in artificial intelligence literature or self-play in the context of games. Corresponds to solving a dynamic programming problem using simulation-based policy iteration. Self-learning connects to policy iteration. In reinforcement learning, there's a distinction between planning and learning. Planning refers to solving a dynamic programming with a model mathematical model, whereas learning uh, refers to solving a dynamic programming problem with simulation, model-free simulation. So learning against relates to simulation, but notice also that the term learning is used in several different places with different meanings each time. So you may find this a little bit confusing. You have to decipher exactly what's meant by the term learning on each, um, in each context. Now, another very unfortunate uh, 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 fact about, uh, about the two fields is the, the differences in notation. 
Reinforcement learning uses transition probability notation. Okay, it uses the symbols S for state, S and S prime for state, A for action. And this defines the probability that you will go at, to state S prime if you are in state S and you apply action A, okay? Um, this is a standard uh, uh, type of notation, transition probabilities in finite state problems, problems with a finite number of states, also called Markovian decision problems, or MDP. On the other hand, control theory traditionally uh, has been using discrete time equations where of this type, where xk denotes the state at time k rather than sk, xk. uk is used in terms of ak, it defines the control. And wk is also the uncertainty. Transition probabilities denote some uncertainty. You don't know where you're going to land if you are at a given state where you apply a certain action. This gives you only the probability that you may be uh, the probability distribution of the next state. Now, this uncertainty is encoded in some random variable here, wk, in the system equation. And this is standard in continuous spaces problems as opposed to finite state problems. In operations research, people use both types of notation for transition probabilities are also used widely. And typically, instead of this type of notation involving parentheses and many symbols, a more compact notation is PIJ, probability of moving from state I to state J under the influence of control U. Now, the important thing to understand is that these two notational systems are mathematically equivalent. Everything that you can do with one notational system, you can do with, with the other. But some, a certain type, some types of notation are more convenient for certain types of problems and some are not. In particular, transition probabilities are very cumbersome for deterministic problems. Uh, we're going to be dealing with deterministic problems quite a bit in this course. In deterministic problems, there is no uncertainty. If you are at a certain stage and you apply a certain action, the next stage is going to be certain. So to start with, if, to, to define your dynamic system or your environment by using probabilities is just very bad. It makes no sense uh, because it confuses, it's very confusing and you can hardly do any mathematical analysis with this kind of notation for deterministic problems. Moreover, when it comes to problems involving in continuous spaces, like uh, control of robots uh, or self-driving cars, things like that, where you have continuous state and control spaces, this type of notation is not very good. It, look, it, deal, it, it takes you to the type of mathematics where you don't want to go, extremely difficult and cumbersome mathematics. So for such problems, uh, this, Discrete time equations are much more convenient and uh, more, more uh, functional when it comes to analysis. On the other hand, if you have a finite state problem, then this type of notation is cumbersome. It's much better to deal with uh, this or with that. So no, two not no notational system is best overall. Depending on the context, uh, there are, um, uh, there are advantages and disadvantages of using the one over the other. Now, what we are going to do in this course, we're going to use both notational systems, mostly this one, but also this one here, depending on the context. Generally, if we have a finite state system, we'll tend to use either, uh, okay, any, a finite state system that's stochastic, like a Markovian decision problems, problem, we're going to be using this type of notation. Otherwise, we're going to be using this type of notation. It's not going to be difficult for you to make the transition, I think, except that there is more notation to carry around. OK, so are there any questions at this point? We're going to have a break and then come back after 15 minutes. But uh, do you have any questions?
Everything's making sense to me. Okay, I'm very glad. Uh, um, so let's um, let's take a break and uh, and uh, for 15 minutes. We're going to convene in 15 minutes exactly, and we're going to be doing this in all our lectures. Gives you a chance to catch your breath, think about the issues relating to the first half of the lecture, ask questions, and uh, so on. And then when we come back, we're going to discuss uh, the dynamic programming algorithm for deterministic problems. So save you in 15 minutes. Okay, we're going to the second half of the lecture. It's a little bit more technical. We're going to be dealing with dynamic programming for deterministic problems. Um, here, we, what we have is a sequence of controls for decisions, starting at some initial state. The controls are at time k is denoted by uk. The state at time k is denoted by xk. And um, the problem is a finite horizon, a finite number of decisions, n, capital N in particular. And the evolution of the system of the state is governed by an equation like this, which gives you the next state given the current state and the current choice of control. So the state state is represented here from xk, we go to xk plus one under the influence to, of control under, according to this function, you can view this function as a table, which gives you the next state given the current state and the control. For a case of a finite number of states and the finite number of controls, it would be a table that you can, that you can, uh, that you can represent uh, this function here. However, we don't make assumptions of finiteness in general. XK could live in any space and UK could live in any space. Although we're going to be dealing with the finite state case uh, quite frequently. So that's how the system operates. It starts at x0, apply control u0, goes to x1. Then apply u1, go to x2. More generally, when we arrive at state xk, we apply a control uk, and we end up going to state xk plus 1. We do this over n stages. And for each one of these transitions, the k transition in particular, there's a certain cost, gk, another function of the state, and the control. And over the end stages, this cost accumulates. And for a given sequence of controls, it gives you a number. This number here is the cost of the sequence. It depends on the, on the control sequence, it depends on the initial state. And I should also note that there's a terminal cost associated with reaching terminal state X again, Xn. So the stage cost and this terminal cost. And uh, so we have a cost function here. For a given initial state, there's a cost function involving, uh, involving the sequence of controls. And what we're trying to do is minimize over all sequences. And the minimum value is denoted by J, J star. It depends on X zero. So it is a function of the initial state. And this is a very central, very central uh, quantity in dynamic programming. All of dynamic programming is geared towards obtaining J star or an approximation to J star or an optimal control sequence or a, an approximation to that. Are there any questions about this slide, what we mean here by the various uh, expressions? Okay, so let's look at an, an important special case, which, which we're going to deal, be dealing quite a bit. The case where there's a finite number of states and controls. So we have these stages, stage zero, the initial states are represented here by the circles, uh, stage one, these are the states represented by the circles here, stage two, and so on. Um, at the end stage, we obtain the last state, xn, 
And um, there are costs associated with each one of these transitions, the costs given by GK, and there's also a terminal cost. Now, for the, you can equally well represent the problem in terms of a, of a, of a system equation as with an acyclic graph like this for the case of a finite number of states in control. On this graph, you can put everything, all the information that, uh, that, uh, that is given. The nodes represent to the states, a layer of states for every stage, and the arcs here correspond to controls. Every arc corresponds to a state control pair, xk, uk, where the start node is xk and the end node is where you end up after you apply x uk. So in particular, if you are a state x1 and you apply control u1, you will end up at state x2 given by this expression. It's uh, certain that we're going to get there. So that's the character of the deterministic problem. There is no uncertainty. If you choose a particular control, you're going to end up at a unique state. There's no possibility of good getting to other states with probabilities. Moreover, each arc has associated with it the arc cost. So each one of these transitions involves a cost and the sum of all these costs is the sum of, the, of these numbers along the arcs. There's also a terminal cost, which takes you from schematically, takes you from the terminal state to some artificial termination state to which we assign cost when this arc to these arcs we assign the cost GN sub XM. So an arc corresponding to a state control pair has a cost like here. And the cost that we're trying to optimize is the sum of all these costs. So given a control sequence, there's a trajectory, a unique trajectory that takes you from X0 to XN and then to the termination state. And the options that we have given the initial state is uh, to choose the sequence, uh, the optimal sequence out of all the, the many sequences and many paths that uh, correspond to them, choose the optimal path. And each arc of, the, of each path has a cost associated with it. So we recognize this as a shortest path problem think of each arc having a length equal to its cost and think of each path have, uh, having uh, the sum of the lengths of its arcs. So that's the length of the path. So what we're trying to do here is find the path of minimum length, the shortest path. It's a classical problem. One of the first problems that you learn in algorithms. And uh, it's, uh, it's, if you have a finite number of states and controls, you have a shortest path problems, a problem. And reversely, actually, if you have a shortest path problem, then you can convert it to a dynamic programming problem of the type I gave it in the previous slide. So this is a very powerful, very convenient, very important connection between deterministic dynamic programming and with a, with a finite horizon and shortest path problems. There are many algorithms that we can use for shortest paths, and you can use dynamic programming, a dynamic programming algorithm for solving a shortest path problem. However, we're going to be focusing primarily on the dynamic programming formulation, but it's important to keep in mind the shortest path equivalence. So let's get to the idea of, a, of the principle of optimality. It's a very, very simple idea. Uh, and it says the following. Suppose that you have an optimal control sequence, U zero star up to UK star all the way to U star of N minus one. And suppose that after the first K control choices, you end up at state XK star. And you consider the tail sub problem the problem of starting at state XK star and going to the end optimally with minimum cost. This is not the same as the original problem. The original problem is when you start at X0 and go all the way to the end. Here we start at some intermediate point 
And let's say that we land at xk star after the first k components of the optimal control sequence. So this is part of the optimal trajectory. What is the solution, the optimal solution of this tail subproblem? Well, it doesn't take much thought to, uh, to figure out that the optimal sequence for the tail subproblems is the tail portion of the optimal sequence for the original problem. In other words, if you start at XK star and use UK star, and then after that, these controls, you're going to end up that you're going to be doing optimally. The tail of an optimal sequence is optimal for the tail subproblem. And why is this true? Can someone say? Yeah, um, hi, uh, this is Kostov. So uh, I I think, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, uh, so I, I think that uh, if if you are at any um, uh, any state, then uh, you uh, you have the choice of taking one path or any other path. And so uh, taking the uh, any other path than the suboptimal one would uh, would make the remaining sequence suboptimal at all times. So uh, that's why you have to take, it's kind of like if you compare with any other option, that's always the best option. So even if the previous path is suboptimal, it doesn't matter. From there, that point onwards, you have uh, it makes sense to just take the optimal one. That's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. If this were not optimal, if it was another sequence that was better, then we could concatenate this with the early portion of the optimal um, of the optimal control sequence and get a better sequence for the original problem. So you have to be you have to stay with the optimal control sequence no matter where you land intermediately. So this is a statement of the principle of finality with a lot of words, but basically it says what uh, what uh, what we discussed. Uh, if you have an optimal control sequence with the corresponding state sequence, consider the tail subproblem that starts at x k star and minimizes over the remaining portion of the the, rem the remaining controls the cost to go from time k okay to time n, then the tail optimal control sequence is optimal for the tail subproblem. Okay, and let's look at it for the generic short finite state problem. Remember finite state problems can be represented by graphs with the circles being the states and the arcs corresponding to control. Um, okay, what are the tail subproblems here? The stage two tail subproblem starts from states over here and goes all the way to the end. Stage one tail subproblem starts from states here and goes to the end. Stage zero tail subproblem is actually the complete problem. Okay. So the principle of Maldi says that if you have an optimal sequence from starting from x0, then if you stop at any intermediate point of the sequence, like this one, and look at going optimally to the end, your optimal sequence is going to continue to be what you found as optimal going from the beginning. Okay. So now we're going to use this idea of tail subproblems and the principle of optimality to go from one tail subproblem to the next, backwards. Okay. Suppose we want to solve a tail subproblem that starts at state xk. And let's call the optimal cost of that problem jk star xk. I'm going to be using star for optimal, generally speaking, optimal quantities in this course. So this is the optimal cost for the tail subproblem that we want to solve. Now, suppose that I have solved the tail subproblem for all possible next states from xk. So from xk, I can choose this control and that control and that control, which leads me to different states. Suppose that I have, I have solved the state subproblems that begin at each one of these states. Then how would I, how could I reformulate my optimization for the for, for, for this state subproblem? 
Well, no matter which state I, I go to, I'm going to have to be using the sequence dictated by the tail subproblem. So I can consider all possible controls to all possible next states and then take the optimal solution of the corresponding tail subproblem. So what I need to do is take the cost of this first transition, add to it the optimal cost of the tail subproblem, which I have to follow if I am to act optimally, and then optimize over all possible controls. So I, I, n minus k stage problem has been reduced to a one stage problem, assuming of course that I have solved all of these tail sub problems. And this is the basic idea of dynamic program. It solves all the tail sub problems going backwards and uses this optimal solution of a given tail sub problem to find the optimal solution of a tail sub problem of one stage more, of, of length one more. So we solve all tail sub problems efficiently by using the principle of optimality solve all the tail sub problems of a given time length using the solution of all the tail sub problems of shorter time length. And here's the dynamic programming algorithm. It produces the optimal costs of all the tail sub problems for every stage x, xk. It starts at the end. The, at the end, you have to the tail sub problem is simply to take the terminal cost as a function of the terminal plan. And then at the k stage, I consider all possible controls, consider the cost associated with the transition from xk to the next state, which is fk of xk uk, xk plus one, and then take the optimal cost of the corresponding tail sub problem, which I have already computed. So I go backwards here, starting from this, compute J star N minus one of X N minus one by using this recursion and then go to K equals N minus two, N minus three and so on. And at the last step, I obtain J zero star of X zero, but that's the optimal cost of the tail sub problem from the initial state which is the cost of the problem that I was trying to solve, the original, the, the, the optimal cost of the original problem. So that's dynamic programming for you. Um, cranking backwards this, this uh, iteration and generating at every step, the corresponding optimal cost of the tail sub problems. So now this dynamic programming algorithm applies to problems with an infinite state space or a finite state space. Uh, if you have finite state space problem, then you can do it graphically. You can put, you lay your problem down on paper and uh, do things, uh, do this iteration manually. It's very costly to do so, but uh, uh, what you would have to do is uh, start at all these states, record the terminal cost, then go to these states, do this computation. Uh, for example, at this state, look at these two controls, add the immediate transition cost with the terminal cost, and then choose, and then, and then record the optimal uh, value, which corresponds to, which is the optimal uh, cost of the tail sub problem starting from here. You do this calculation for every state and then you're ready to go one step back. You do it for every state, one step back and so on until you reach X zero and then you have solved your problem. Now, suppose that you have calculated through this computation that can be overwhelming, okay? okay. Um, you have obtained all these J stars. J n star, J n minus one star, all the way to J zero star. How do you construct, construct an optimal control sequence? 
Well, it's very simple. You use this minimization from dynamic programming, but this time going forwards. What is the contraction? The construction of the J star goes backwards. The construction of the optimal control sequence goes forward. You start at X zero and you look at all these controls here. You compare, you add the corresponding J one star of X one, and you compare this expression minimize over the four possibilities, and that gives you the optimal uh, control for the first stage and the optimal next stage. So you started here, you did this calculation forward, you went one step, one step, one step up to X1 star. Then you do the calculation for these two controls and going forward, you find the optimal one and uh, you end up at X2 star and so on. And step by step, you end up constructing the entire optimal control sequence and the corresponding optimal state sequence. So there's backwards calculation, which can be hard, and forwards calculation that can be hard also. And that's where reinforcement learning will come in, making these calculations uh, easier. On the other hand, I'd like to spend some time with a couple of examples. Um, Okay, here's an example. We're gonna go through these calculations somewhat quickly, but, um, but you can review uh, these calculations uh, at your leisure. This is a scheduling problem where we want to find the optimal way to sequence four operations, A, B, C, and D. Now there are some constraints. Operation A must be done before before B and operation C must be done before, before D. And there are costs in uh, sequen sequencing costs. Uh, um, to go from A to A to B, there's a certain cost associated with it. And similarly, to go from any one, of op any one operation to the next operation, there are set up costs, there's some kind of a cost there, which is given. So how do we formulate this as a, a dynamic programming problem? Well, one way to do it is what I'm showing here in this graph. Uh, actually in dynamic programming, there may be multiple ways in given a certain problem, there might be multiple ways to formulate them as dynamic programming problems. And here we're going to formulate in a particular way where the states are the partial schedules. So we're going to postulate that we start at the empty schedule. This is our initial state. And uh, after the initial state, we can either perform A or C because of these constraints. So these are going to be the states at stage one. Then we have to select another operation that we have not done before. And, uh, and uh, it's possible to do B or C and so on. Uh, so we construct operations involving no, uh, you construct states involving no operation, one operation, two operations, three operations. And then once you have the three operations, the fourth operation is automatically determined. And we write down the costs uh, associated with the transitions. So here we assume that there's a cost of uh, five to apply operation A initially, a cost of three for C. To apply B after A, there's a cost of two. C after A, there's a cost of three and similar. These are the transition costs from a given part partial schedule to a feasible partial schedule that's one operation more, okay? And at the end, we also have some numbers as co co corresponding to the last operation. So six is the cost of doing operation D, the one that's remaining after C. One is the cost of doing B, of doing, I'm sorry, doing D after B and so on. So these are the terminal costs. These are the transition costs. These are the states and the controls are determined by the arcs. So 
we're going to apply dynamic programming. The idea is to break down the problem into smaller pieces, take sub problems, and we're going to stand at the end and go backwards. Okay, so we have the terminal costs, which are given in red squares here, the, these red uh, numbers, and we want to, to solve the stage two subproblems. So an example of that is one that starts at CA and uh, acts optimally. So what calculation do we have to do? Well, there are two possibilities, choosing B after A, which costs us two to go from A to B, and then a terminal cost of one to add the final operation D from B. So this gives us a three, this gives us a four plus three. So the minimum of the two is three, okay? And that's what we write down. This purple number is the, is the optimal cost of this tail subproblem. Now we do this thing for all the tail subproblems. Uh, okay, here this, okay, there's only one possibility. So it's three plus six is nine. Is, uh, is two plus three is five. Here, there are two possibilities, either go here or go here. The minimum is five. So now we have gone, we have done one step of the dynamic programming algorithm and uh, have recorded the corresponding cost, optimal cost for the tail subproblems. Um, now let's go, go one step back. We have the red numbers, we, do, we, we have the purple, we have the purple numbers from the previous calculation. And now we go to calculate the tail, the optimal cost of the tail subproblems for these two states. And uh, so to solve this tail subproblem, we don't have to go all the way to the end. Instead, we can take the cost of the immediate transition, add to it the purple number, which gives me a seven here, and gives me an 11 here, so the minimum is seven. And this is the optimal cost of this tail sub problem starting from this state. We do this for both states. Here we have a two plus nine is 11, three plus five is an eight. So we record that number as well. And now we can go one step back, solve the green subproblem, tail subproblem, which is the original problem. And now it's very simple. We don't have to go all the way, consider all possible paths. Instead, what we have to do is compare five plus eight and three plus seven. And that gives us the optimal cost equal to 10. So the optimal cost over all schedules is 10. And uh, and this is the J star of the problem, the J star of the initial state. Now, how do we construct the optimal sequence going forward? To calculate, to solve the tail sub problems, we went backwards. Now to construct the optimal sequence, we need to go forward. And we do that by starting here, look at the two possibilities. This is a 13, this is a 10. So we go here. Then we look at the two possibilities. This is a four plus three, seven and six plus five, 11, so we go here. Uh, and uh, now we look at the two possibilities, go to, it's two plus one to go to take this arc and four plus three to take this arc. So we, we this is the optimal. So we have constructed the optimal, um, the optimal schedule. And that's the dynamic programming algorithm for this very, very simple example. Of course, this gives you a hint that the calculations can be overwhelming if you have a very, very large number of states, let alone if the number of states is infinite, in which case you have to do some approximation, some discretization, but, but well, there are many, many ways to approximate continuous state problems that we're going to discuss in the future. Are there any questions about this example? Okay, here's another example that we're going to use, be used actually in the future, travel, sa traveling salesman problem. Uh, traveling salesman problem involves a number of cities that a salesman have to go, has to go through 
each city has to be reached once and only once. So, uh, and, and the salesman has to return in the city where he started. In this particular case, we have four cities and we are given a matrix of intercity travel costs. So to go from city A to city B, it takes five, a cost of five. To go from A to C, it's a one. To go to A, from A to, to, to D, it's a 15 and so on. For every pair of cities, we have the corresponding travel cost. And we formulate the problem of finding the optimal sequence of cities as a dynamic programming problem, similar to the scheduling problem that I gave earlier. Um, we consider a state's partial tours, okay? A partial tour is a complete tour involves all four cities, okay? Once, each one appearing once and only once. Uh, a partial schedule involves more than four cities, less than four cities. So we start at some city and we arbitrarily choose the city to be A. And uh, then there are three possibilities, go to city B, C, or D. And then from after going to A and B, then go to C or D and so on. Uh, we construct this acyclic graph that corresponds to state transitions. And we take this intercity travel cost and we put them next to the arc. So going from A to B is a five cost. Going from A to D is a 15 cost. Going from A to C is a one cost. So we put down all these numbers and we do dynamic programming starting from the terminal state, which is city A. Remember, we have to go from city A and come back to city A through one of these paths. That's uh, that's according to the rules of travel and say some problem. So, let's solve the tail sub problem. But this is a trivial problem because at each one of these states, after going through all cities, we have to return to city A and the cost for that is fixed. There's no choice to be made. So from D, going to A, it costs uh, 15, okay? From C to go to A, it costs one, and so on. So we, we record the optimal cost of the tail subproblems of length one, okay? These are the red numbers that you see here, okay? 15 to 15, and so on. Now, actually the tail subproblems, uh, the tail subproblems, of length two are also trivial. There's only one choice to be made because once you have three cities, the fourth one is automatically determined. So adding 15 and three gives one 18, adding one to three gives you a four and so on. These red numbers here are the optimal cost of the, uh, of the tail sub problems of length two. Now we go to states to these states here and try to solve the corresponding tail sub problems. Now here there's a choice. After going to B from A, there's a choice of going to C and going to D. Going to C costs us a 20 from here and an 18 from this, uh, from the optimal cost of, the, of, the, of, this, of, of this tail sub problem. So this gives me a 20 plus 18, that's 38. Going the other way gives me a four plus four, eight. So this is the best choice and the corresponding optimal cost of the tail sub problem is eight. We do the same thing starting from this city. Okay, we compare 20 plus 19, 39. Uh, three plus nine is 12. So the optimal is 12. And similarly here, four plus 21 is 25, 28, so this wins. And now we have solved all of these tail sub problems and we go to the initial state and compare the three controls. Five plus eight is 13, one plus 12 is 13, and, uh, and 25 plus, plus, plus 15 is 40. So now we have two optimal solutions, right? This one is optimal as well as this one is optimal. So I can start from here and construct going forward an optimal solution. 
but I can start here and going, go forward along this branch and construct an equally good optimal solution. So in this particular case, we have uh, two, uh, two optimal solutions and this can happen in general, of course. Are there any questions about this example? We're going to be returning to it uh, in the future lectures. Okay, staying with uh, finite state problems, it turns out that any finite state problem, not necessarily having a sequential structure, can be addressed by dynamic programming and the and in the way that we have uh, discussed it here. In particular, let's consider a generic problem, the generic discrete optimization problem of minimizing a cost function of some u, vector u, subject to u being in some constraint set. And we assume that each u has n components, okay? Like for example, in the scheduling problems that we had in the previous slides, uh, each u corresponds to a city or corresponds to, to an operation. More generally here, we consider the case where u consists of multiple components. And uh, let's formulate this problem as a dynamic programming problem. We start from an artificial state and the first state is going to be just the first choice of control, of component, I'm sorry. Stage two is going to correspond to pairs of components, U0 and U1. State three, state, stage three is going to correspond to states involving three components. And uh, stage N is going to correspond to solutions, feasible solutions of our problem here. And all of these transitions involve no cost except the last one, where we get a cost of G sub U. Of course, in special cases, there might be intermediate costs that we may consider here. Now, what are the transitions? From this state, which corresponds to the first control, we can choose the second control that will take us to a state like that, okay? And uh, similarly, the transitions correspond to the choice of component corresponding to the state. So there is an acyclic graph again here, and uh, we can start from this terminal cost and go backwards and solve this problem, obtaining the, the optimal cost of the tail sub problems, and then find the optimal solution by going forward according to the numbers that we have found. So that's the idea here. View the components as the controls of the end stages and define as the state at the k stage to be the first k components. We introduce an artificial start state, and we define the cost to be just the term, just use of you at the terminal stage, and all other costs being zero. Okay, is there a problem with this formulation that you can see? Well, there's an exponential growth of the number of states. As I go forward, I add one more component, it's an exponential growth. Uh, the the, the look-ahead tree, the, the tree corresponding to the problem grows very, very quickly. And this method is not recommended as an exact dynamic programming method, except in very, very special cases. However, uh, this formulation makes a lot of sense for approximate dynamic programming and the method of approximation in value space that I'm going to discuss next and the reinforcement learning methods in general. So while dynamic programming is not recommended for problems like that, it's a very, very broad class of problems, combinatorial problems, integer programming problems, all kinds of very, very difficult problems. Dynamic programming, exact dynamic programming is not recommended for problems like that. Approximate dynamic programming and the methods that we're going to discuss, for example, rollout, are very well suited to solve this problem, in my opinion, are very effective. Okay, so what's the connection between uh, exact dynamic programming and approximate dynamic programming and, and reinforcement learning? The major connection is what I'm gonna show you here in this slide. 
we have the exact dynamic programming algorithm for the generic finite, uh, finite horizon deterministic problem. And uh, the way we constructed optimal control sequence after we have computed the J stars is to go forward, starting with J zero star, calculate the next state, and sequentially go forward, calculate X two star, X three star, and so on, all the way to the end. That's what exact dynamic programming does. Approximate dynamic programming, in particular, the method of approximation in value space is the following simple thing. Instead of J stars, which can be overwhelming to compute, which you may not be able to compute, use some J tilde functions that you obtain somehow by hook or by crook because uh, somebody gave them to you or you have used offline training, neural networks or other approximation architectures. That's the idea. In place of the object that's very hard to compute, use an approximation and use some kind of training, offline training. Then you can use, once you have the J tildes, you can use online play to generate an approximate control sequence. You have J1 tilde and at the very first stage at X0, you apply the control that minimizes this expression. This takes you not to the optimal next state, but to a state X1 tilde given by this expression here, corresponds to the initial state and the control that you have computed. And then you continue going forward. You obtain U1 tilde, then U2 tilde, and the corresponding X tilde states. And this is the recursion. And you can view this as the online play algorithm. The offline training algorithm, which is impossible to do, is this one. The feasible offline training algorithm involves computing J tildes in place of J stars. And online play now involves going forward with J tilde in place of J star. This is a much simpler operation. And by the way, once you have J tilde, it does not depend on the size of the state space. It depends only on the size of the control space, of the control constraint rather, because these are the, number, these are the numbers that you're going to compare. In the reinforcement learning parlance, these are called the Q factors corresponding to the different controls. And we use the control with minimal Q factor going forward like this. This calculation holds true for deterministic problems. For stochastic problems, it's more complicated. It also involves an expected value here, something that we're going to talk about in the next lecture. But that in a nutshell, is what we're going to be doing when it comes to, approx to, to, to deterministic problems. Of course, there will be variations of these problems. Extensions, here we have considered the simplest case, the shortest path type of case. Here we're going to, then in the next lecture, starting with the next lecture, we're con going to consider various extensions. Stochastic finite horizon problems. For the next state, is not fully determined by XK and UK, but is also affected by a random parameter. This is more difficult calculation. We're going to consider both uh, uh, exact and approximate dynamic programming. In either case, the calculation is more difficult than the deterministic case. And part of it has to do is that this problem is not equivalent to a shortest path problem. It's far more difficult. Then we're going to consider infinite horizon problems where the number of states stages is, uh, is infinite. And there the calculations, well, the exact dynamic programming theory is mathematically more complex. It's more sophisticated. There are exceptions. The dynamic programming theory for finite horizon problems is very, very simple. But for infinite horizon problems, it's quite intricate and uh, you need more mathematics to understand it fully. However, both the theory and the algorithm that it leads to are more elegant. The method of policy iteration, for example, which is the workhorse of reinforcement uh, learning, uh, needs to be understood primarily in the context of infinite horizon problems. We're going to get to this problem starting with the next lecture and then further in the future. 
Okay, here's another class of problems that's very important and also poses a lot of challenges. Partial state information problems. Sometimes people call them POMDP, partial observation, Markovian decision problems. Okay, in our, uh, we're going to be making the assumptions for stochastic problems that at every stage we observe the current state. We have full knowledge of XK when we apply UK. This is called perfect state information. However, imperfect state information or partial state information problems, you don't have the exact value of the state. Instead, you have you collect measurements relating to the value to, to the states, and uh, you accumulate those measurements and you do some form of estimation. There's a probabilistic state that comes out of this estimation, which is actually called a belief state. And this complicates uh, matters a great deal. Conceptually, however, partial state information problems can be converted to perfect state information problems. There is a procedure, mathematical procedure for doing so. And once you have the perfect state information problem, then you can apply dynamic programming for the perfect information case. The dynamic programming algorithm becomes even harder, much harder to solve even approximately. So this is a very challenging class of problems, even with approximations. On the other hand, the number of applications is very, very large. And, uh, and uh, uh, people are working actively in this area. It's the kind of problems that uh, you often see when reinforcement learning is advertised. You'd like to have robots that walk into a room with having no idea what's in the room and then look around and find interesting things to do, identify objects that, are, that, that, that can be useful, and then they figure out what to do with these objects and then do them. Now, this is a bit of fantasy, okay? But it gives you an idea of the kind of uh, difficulty associated with uh, imperfect state information problems. To give you another example of a, of a, a difficult type of uh, perfect state information problem, think of chess. With chess, with, with, with some additional, with some strange, characteristics whereby, okay, chess is a game of perfect state information because you can work sure, perfectly the state and you know exactly what the moves are. In that sense, chess is somewhat easy. It's the partial state information problems are more difficult than chess. Difficult as chess is, partial state information problems are harder. To get an idea, think of chess, but with an outer set of rules where all of a sudden, somebody comes from the outside and says, I'm going to take out your queen. And now you're going to, you have to play without a queen. That happens at random times. Or your pawns cannot move forwards anymore, but they can move backwards instead. And again, this will happen, this change of rules is going to happen at a random time. And uh, um, how would you deal with problems like that? Well, control engineers actually have been dealing with problems like that for a long time in the context of adaptive control, where systems that you are controlling are changing over time and their parameters change, their model change, the state change. Like for example, when a car goes into, onto a road and from a, a smooth road goes onto a bumpy road, okay, all of a sudden. That's a change of environment, that's a change of model. Or when one person is in the car, uh, and then three more persons come in. It's a change of environment uh, because the weight of the car is affected and its motion, uh, it's, 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 it's motion is affected. So these problems of partial state information include also adaptive control problems. Um, and they have been studied for years and years and years, and they are known to be extremely difficult. But now we have new techniques. We have more powerful computers and people are attempting to solve them, often with success. We're going to discuss problems like that sometime in the future. Okay, there are also game problems and minimax problems, which uh, involve two players, and therefore they involve an extension 
of uh, the dynamic programming framework that we have discussed, which involves only one player. They are, this exact dynamic programming theory is substantially more complex, but then the most spectacular successes of reinforcement learning involve games. So we're going to take inspiration out of games, but we're not going to get very much in great detail into them. Are there any questions? You're very silent and uh, um, I'd like to think that you understand everything, but, uh, but I'm also worried. Are there any questions? Just soaking in everything that's being said. <laughs> Okay, it's a lot that's being said, so I understand. Okay, now let's uh, get off dynamic programming and look at the, how this course is going to be run. My principal aim to get you to think about research and how reinforcement learning applies to your research interests. I know that you come from different walks of life and different uh, research environments. Uh, it's perfectly fine to focus on your research environment, your current research perhaps, or research that you think you're doing. But I'd like you to think about how reinforcement learning and the kind of things that we do in this course applies to your problems. And then, then you can discuss your research interests with me and also uh, expand on them through a term paper. Um, the requirements for this course. There's going to be homework. In the early part of the course, it's going to be three or four homeworks that involve part, uh, part analysis, part computation. There's going to be a computation component. Even though this course is not about coding, I'm not going to be supplying you with codes of any kind or teach you on how to use particular codes. Uh, this homework is going to involve coding using your favorite software and favorite, favorite computer, mostly MATLAB, for example. That's, that's going to be sufficient. Um, then, this is going to be 25% of the grade. And incidentally, the homework problems have solutions which uh, are accessible to you. Uh, you can consult the solutions. I have no problem with that. However, you have to write your own solutions and also write your own code, which we are going to check. So I think uh, I'd like to think that it's good for you to have the solutions available so that when you get stuck, you can consult them and you can use them for a better understanding of the problem you're given. Then the major part of the grade, 75% of the grade is a research-oriented term paper. And here you have two choices. The first choice is a mini research project on whatever you, is interesting to you, but also connecting with reinforcement learning. And you may work in teams, up to three persons. Uh, I'd like to encourage you to do a mini research project and I'm, I, I will work with you to the extent that uh, I can be helpful. And uh, at the end of the class, we're going to have uh, project presentations. Um, on the other hand, there's another option, a read and report type of term paper, whereby you will take two or three research publications, journal papers or other reports um, that connect. Uh, they should be connected and uh, you should critically review them and draw some conclusions from them. Um, the, your, the choice of publication is up to you and you can also consult me or if you want me to give you some hints, uh, I, can, I will do that. Um, they, there are no office hours for this course. Incidentally, I should say that our teaching assistant is uh, Jameson Weber, who is a uh, who is listed uh, in Canvas somewhere. Uh, but, uh, um, but, if you, but I'm not going to be holding office hours at any specific time, but I'm very open to one-on-one -on -one or group to one uh, meetings. Um, may have, <laughs> I'm concerned about COVID a little bit, so we may have to go outside somewhere, depending on the weather. But, um, uh, but, uh, feel free to send me email and we'll arrange a time that's convenient for, for you and me. Um, the, okay, a word about notation. Uh, 
there's a great diversity of culture around reinforcement learning. There are people in artificial intelligence, control theory, operation research, discrete optimization. Uh, they focus on different problems, give different, they use different notations. And uh, uh, artificial intelligence and operations just fo focus primarily on discrete and finite state problems, which are finite state problems, which are stochastic except when it comes to some strands of artificial intelligence like in search, automated search, address, for the, address to a great extent deterministic problems, not just stochastic problems. But in any case, in stochastic problems, uh, the, in these fields, uh, transition probabilities are being used. I'm going to be using PIJs of U to describe this partition, transition probabilities. Now, control theorists use a system equation notation. And as I mentioned, this notation is well suited for continuous state problems and also for deterministic problems. I'm going to be using that too, either this or that. Now, I strongly encourage you to use my notation and my terminology for the course. The reason is that if you talk to me with different, using different terms, and you write for me using a different notation, I will just not be able to understand it. There's a language problem here, and uh, it, can, it, can, uh, it can impede communication very much. So I strongly encourage you to understand the meaning of the terms as I use them, and also use my notation. Please try to make an effort. Um, there is, uh, the, the syllabus is on Canvas, and uh, the topics that we are going to cover are what you see here. Um, the syllabus is a little different uh, than in other years. Uh, in particular, we're going to skip some topics that were covered in, the, uh, in, the, in previous years. Your notes are going to have three chapters. The first chapter is uh, focused primarily on on deterministic, on, on, on exact dynamic programming, but also in various type of problems that you can deal with in approximations. The second chapter is uh, deals with the rollout, the rollout algorithm in particular and its various applications. The third chapter leads, uh, 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 deals with neural networks, how you use them to represent uh, value functions and policies. So, these are, these are the range of talks that we're going to be covering, exact and approximate dynamic programming, approximation value and policy space, offline training and online play and Newton's method, rollout and approximate policy iteration, model predictive and adaptive control, multi-agent problems. Um, we're gonna spend quite a bit of time on multi-agent problems, training of uh, neural networks and approximation architectures, and also policy networks and approximation policy space. It's going to be mostly approximation in value space, less on policy space, and it's going to be uh, not much on neural networks, probably about one lecture, although the notes have a substantial content, uh, our lecture is going to be probably only one lecture on neural networks. On the other hand, we're going to be referring to neural networks and approximation architectures and what they can do as we go along. So. The first four lectures are going to provide an introduction and an overview of the subject. I want to bring you to the point where you can read some literature and you can get started to your term paper, hopefully after the first four lectures. Then I'm, we're going to discuss some of these topics selectively in greater or, or lesser depth. Are there any questions about the topics that we're going to cover? Uh, probably you have a few things in mind when you join this course, and uh, you may be wondering how your interests correlate with the syllabus. Uh, feel free to ask questions now or send me an email about, uh, about what you, what's, in your, what's in your mind. Are there any questions? Okay, a few things about math. Um, 
Math requirements for this course are modest. What we, the prerequisites listed is a full course in calculus and a first course in probability theory. Both of these are going to be important. Um, I know that all of you had some probability. I know that all of you have had some calculus. My experience has been that unless you practice with these methodologies, these mathematics over time, they tend to be forgotten. So I would encourage you to brush up on what you have learned on calculus and probability, and also try to try to get a mathematical frame of mind for, whereby you understand concepts in terms of equations as opposed to code, okay, or pseudo code. Um, there will going to be some pseudo code uh, uh, in. Uh, uh, that's going to be given to you, but most of the communication is going to be through equations. So you got to learn the language, otherwise you're going to be missing a lot. Now I'm not talking about uh, sophisticated mathematics necessarily of the type that a mathematician would appreciate and use. I'm talking more about understanding basic algorithms through equations as opposed to pseudocode. Um, so consider this and uh, and uh, see how you can adapt to, to the style of this course. Now, our objective is not to develop new mathematics, but rather to develop, to use mathematics, to develop insight. The best way to obtain insight into new concepts and new algorithms is through mathematics. That's a fact. And, uh, uh, and, the, and so by, by looking into the mathematics, you're going to, enhance your insight into the mechanism of various methods, and you're going to be able to understand how to construct variations, new methods, and how to start research. So I'd like to encourage you very much to pay attention to the mathematical component of this, of this uh, course. As I said, the mathematical framework is critically important to develop insight. Uh, you need some human thought, structure of human thought. Mathematical reasoning is the most suitable for this purpose. There's also some a general difficulty with machine learning in general and reinforcement learning in particular. Uh, the algorithms become so complicated and they use complicated components like neural networks that they're not, that the algorithms cannot, at some level, cannot be very inciting. In, insightful. It's very hard to understand what's going on inside the neural network. People try to understand, but it's very difficult to understand what takes place between input to a neural network and output of the neural network. It's just, it's just like a magic box, okay, that, uh, that uh, gives you helpful answers in some contexts. But the upshot is that we don't know why they work. Why do neural networks work? How, why do reinforcement algorithms work? So we don't know if they can be trusted. And in, indeed, there are plenty of counterexamples and failures to point to that indicate that they cannot be trusted. So if the algorithm goes wrong, how do you know what went wrong? That's, there's, a, there's a problem here. We want answers and we want insight, but we don't always get it. And this is going to be a source of tension in our interactions with computers from now on. It's just a fact of life that, um, and I hope that you and, and that we have to face and we try to get as much insight as we can uh, in whatever we do in this area because there's a shortage of insight. Okay, our lectures are going to be same time, same place, uh, same format. And uh, what we're going to cover is uh, dynamic programming for stochastic problems and the corresponding approximation in value space ideas. Uh, we did in this lecture, we did deterministic problems. We're going to go into stochastic problems. Brush up a little bit on your probability, expected values, uh, what would they mean? How do they translate within the context of dynamic programming? Uh, try to read as much as you can from the class notes. They are online, try to read as much as you can. And, uh, it would be helpful for you to watch a video lecture of the sec second video lecture of the previous two offerings of this class, again, at the same website. So that's the end of uh, this lecture. 
Are there any questions about the organization of the class and uh, anything that you have in mind? I see someone in the chat, I look at the chat and says, nope, <laughs> no questions. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I had, so not really a question, but I was wondering if there is a determined place where uh, students can discuss things among, because it's like a research focused uh, class. So uh, anything like any paper they read, maybe discussing among us, is there like a Slack or a, uh, or a forum that's predetermined? And we can also ask questions to instructors, but also like within ourselves. Yeah, you mean like a forum of some sort? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we don't meet each yeah. other physically, so I was wondering like how to interact. Or uh, yeah, that would be great. If we, if we didn't do that in the previous previous offerings, and I'll discuss with Jameson. Perhaps uh, we can set up some kind of a forum in in uh, in Canvas. Uh, Jameson, is that possible within Canvas? Yeah, there is already a discussion page where students can post uh, comments and respond to each other. Uh, I could also see about possibly getting a, a Slack channel for the course, which is like a it's like a chat application that's a, maybe a little bit more convenient to use. Could also do a Discord. Also a possibility. Yeah, maybe maybe well, I, I'll think about it. But yes, there are there is some way to to have a forum for the course. That would be wonderful. Yeah, that would give me an opportunity to to gauge uh, uh, where you are and uh, what uh, your concerns are. So in addition to, I'll be reading the forum comments uh, and, uh, and uh, like I said, you can contact me by email at any time for either, either your questions or a meeting uh, or something you want to discuss. Yeah, thank you. That would be great. Okay, very good. Any other questions? Uh, excuse me, sir. Uh, what will be the grading scheme like? Uh, so, how much percent will we get A or B? I have not yet given a B in this class in the four years, <laughs> but. Uh, it's all A's. On the other hand, uh, you have to do the work. If you don't submit a term paper or you submit a shoddy term paper, then then I I may not give you a B. I may give you, however, a, 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 not a passing grade. I may give you an incomplete and ask you to do more work. Um, and uh, so, but as long as you do a decent effort and you're connected to the course, you show through your homework and through your, uh, through your um, term paper that you're connected to the course and you're making a strong effort to be with it, then you will very, very likely get an A. Okay, sir. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Okay. I'm nice to you guys. You're gonna get A's if you stay with this course. If uh, you have difficulties, you'll probably know about it and you might drop out. We had some cases like that, but never a case of a, of a grade other than A. It's possible that this course may not be for you uh, because like I said, it's a PhD course basically. And it will involve some mathematics that um, you may not be familiar with. And it may go somewhat fast because it's research oriented, but, um, but try to stay with it, read ahead, okay? Uh, do the homework uh, in time and read uh, read the uh, class notes ahead and, and watch video lectures or look at the slides from previous class offerings. And that uh, can be very helpful, I think, in staying with the course. Okay, uh, I'm very excited about this course. I wish you all good luck and we'll see you next uh, week.